uh, seminar on the, the apocalypse here in the book of Revelation. And uh, tonight we're going to have a very interesting discussion of uh, Gog of Magog and the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, we have a lot of territory to cover. We're going to cover uh, some of Daniel chapter 8, uh, some of Daniel chapter 11, some of Daniel chapter 12. Uh, we're going to cover some of Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39, and uh, we're going to show you where the, these verses uh, are. Uh, we have a reader with us tonight that's going to be uh, uh, doing our special reading for us since we have uh, a lot of territory to cover. And uh, uh, Chuck Williams will be doing that honor for us, and we appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm going to turn to Revelation 16, uh, which is the subject of the bowls of wrath, uh, which is the fifth uh, section in the book of Revelation. And uh, I'm going to discuss there, uh, right in the midst of these bowls of wrath, uh, there's a reference to a Hebrew word. And uh, it says in the 16th chapter of Revelation that in verse 10, uh, the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. They blasphemed God, uh, the God of heaven, because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel uh, poured out his bowl upon the great uh, river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, uh, that the way may be prepared for the kings from the east. Uh, and uh, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Uh, it's amazing uh, here that, uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, took the form of a dove, and uh, God took the form of uh, the Son, Jesus. And here, the devil's unclean spirits took the form of a frog. So that kind of tells you something. Uh, so you might say the frogs are demons incarnate here. And they are the spirits of demons, uh, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together uh, for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Uh, he said, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one uh, that stays awake and keeps his garments lest he walk about uh, naked, and men see his shame. And they gathered them together, the place which is in the Hebrew is called uh, Armageddon. Uh, that's the only time that uh, this is found in the book of Revelation, in the, book, in the New Testament, in fact. Uh, Armageddon. But it corresponds to Revelation 20, where it says here, uh, that in verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the, the, the sand of the seashore. Those two references in uh, Re uh, Revelation 16, Revelation 20, are the only two references in the Bible to this particular Armageddon and uh, which is the harm means mountain, uh, Gatton means Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo, and uh, the battle that was at one time fought there. And uh, it, it said it's in the Hebrew. It's a Hebrew word. Uh, so you need to know a little Hebrew history. And if you're going to understand harm or Gatton, you need to know. It's a, a very important that you know a little Hebrew history. But in context, I want, to, I want you to take an overview of God's holy word from the beginning to the end. Uh, God said of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, you may not freely eat, uh, but they did eat. They learned evil. So good and evil came into existence there for humanity. I'm sure that good and evil was in existence in eternity. Certainly there were evil angels before that, and I'm sure that God knew what evil was. Uh, even though it hadn't started yet, uh, before the first sinner, which was Satan. But God knew what it was. But God could handle evil. God could live in, uh, with the idea of evil, and it didn't bother him. But 
but evil bothers you. It bothers me. It bothers Satan. It bothers everybody. And uh, so down through the years of history, you have good and evil. And uh, we can honestly say that evil was superior to good. In fact, in the first 2,000 years of history, evil had triumphed over good to the place uh, that God had to bring the moral universe to a, to a close uh, by the great deluge. And uh, evil had triumphed to the place that, uh, that every imagination of man and woman's heart was continually evil. And of course, good and evil is a theological study in itself. I could spend the whole night talking about uh, just good and evil. Uh, theologians and philosophers have discussed it down through the years, and people make money lecturing on good and evil. But sufficient for tonight, I want to show you that evil overturned good, and God, who is good, <laughs> who is in control, had to bring evil to its final demise there. But evil started up again. From Abraham to Moses, you have uh, about 300 and some years. Uh, and then uh, they're in Egyptian bondage and great evil. And then you have the Mosaical law. You have the prophets. And uh, the law and the prophets come down until about 400 years before Christ. So you might divide that second 2,000-year span into two groups, uh, from Abraham to the 400-year period before Christ would be one uh, grouping, and then the 400-year period after that before uh, Malachi, from Malachi to John the Baptist, 400 years of silence where there were no prophets. Now, during that time, they had the Bible. The Bible was translated into Greek. Uh, the Septuagint was available. So they could read the Bible, but they didn't have prophets. All they could read was the Bible. No prophets. When John the Baptist came on the scene, being the first prophet after 400 years of silence, they certainly listened because if you go 400 years without a prophet, you're going to start listening. Uh, I think we're kind of in a, a dearth like that even in America today. It's hard to find anybody that preaches the Word of God anymore. And uh, when you preach it, people listen to it like as if it's something you never heard before. Well, tonight... You're going to hear something you've never heard before, I'm sure. What I'm going to do is show you what they were reading about during that 400 years of, of, of time between Malachi, the last prophet, and John the Baptist. Now, good and evil, the, the word dualism means that good and evil could be equal, but dualism actually believes that evil is superior to good. Uh, and then you have the Gnostic thought that all matter is evil. Uh, therefore, eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow you die. <laughs> I see that everywhere. People still believe that. Uh, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Let's live it up. We're going to die. There is no God. There's no eternity. There are no consequences. So evil still looks very attractive. But if ever we learn that good is going to have ultimate supremacy over evil, and the ultimate victory will be on the side of good. It's when we read what we're going to read tonight. So uh, Chuck Williams will be reading for us. And uh, I'm going to read a few verses here, and then Chuck's going to read uh, after that. Uh, Daniel had a vision. And uh, we have a chart here of Daniel and his vision uh, as he uh, looks up and sees a ram and a goat. And the ram, of course, and Daniel was envisioning that ram and, and a goat uh, with four horns butts the ram to death, which was a, uh, a tremendous victory. Uh, that ram, uh, it was a shaggy ram, kind of a, sh uh, I mean, uh, that goat was a shaggy goat, stood for Alexander the Great, and the four horns on that ram stood for his four generals, Cassander, uh, Lysicamus, and uh, the Ptolemy and Seleucius, those four generals of uh, Alexander the Great. The world was split uh, into four kingdoms, and here we have the four heads uh, on the leopard. The leopard had four heads, and those four heads stood for the four uh, kings that would eventually succeed Alexander the Great, but they didn't have Alexander the Great's ability to govern 
And uh, so the kingdom split into four groups. Eventually, the northern group and the southern group, uh, it split into those two groups called the northern part of the empire and the southern part of the empire. The northern part of the empire fell to Seleucius, uh, who was one of Alexander the Great's uh, generals. And the southern empire fell to uh, Ptolemy. And of course, it's P-T-O-L-O-M-Y, but the P is silent, so uh, you come up with Ptolemy. Now, of all of the successors of Ptolemy, they all wore that name. They were called the Ptolemy family. And uh, I think there were something like 13 Ptolemies down through that period of time, all the way down to 146 B.C. Uh, from 331 B.C. when Alexander the Great, I believe, uh, died. Uh, I may not have my historical dates uh, completely correct, but uh, during that period of time, from about 331 to 146, you had uh, about 13 successors of Alexander the Great's Ptolemy uh, general. The Seleucian general was up around Syria and Thrace uh, and the Grecian part of the empire, and that was a Seleucid, uh, uh, General Seleucid. And uh, some of these Seleucian empires, uh, emperors called themselves uh, Antiochus. So Antiochus, you have Antiochus I, Antiochus II, Antiochus III, Antiochus IV. Uh, here's a picture of Antiochus III. Uh, he was uh, the third of the Antiochuses. Uh, the second of the Antiochus called himself Antiochus Theus, <laughs> which is God, Antiochus God. And uh, this, uh, this was the father to Antiochus IV, uh, who called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, the Greek word Epiphanes means uh, illuminator uh, or one who is illustrious. Uh, and uh, he didn't call himself God, but they were a very egotistical, very arrogant line of people. Uh, and uh, they're described in Daniel chapter 8, uh, in verse 21, the shaggy goat, uh, it represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And the broken horn and the four horns that uh, arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from uh, his nation, uh, though not with his power. Uh, Alexander did not help them. And in the latter period of their rule, this is the uh, succession of the uh, Seleucians and the succession of the Antiochuses, uh, and the latter period of their rule. Uh, Antiochus IV was the next to the last of the rule of the, this particular line of uh, uh, Alexander's generals. Uh, he would, uh, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue, and his power will be mighty, uh, but not by his own power, and he will uh, destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. Uh, he will destroy mighty men and the holy people. So good and evil uh, don't look very equal here. It looks like that this king is going to do all he can to make the whole world evil and worshiping anything but righteousness and a God of holiness. Uh, he wants to overturn a holy and righteous God, and he wants to run holy and righteous people off the face of the earth. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. And, and while the covenant people of God, like most of us, we get at ease, we get comfortable in this world, and we lose our warfare spirit. Uh, we are soldiers. We're at war. And once we lose that, we're going to get defeated every time. It's like when, I don't care if it's boxing, if it's football, if it's basketball, you've got to go for the jugger vein. You've got you to fight to win. You can't take your opponent for granted. And you've got to go in there and clean up until the very last mop up, until the very last mess is over with. Uh, and, uh, uh, but these people got at ease and comfortable in the affluent world of that day. And uh, while they were comfortable, wickedness was running roughshod over them. Uh, the only thing that evil needs to succeed is for righteousness to keep its mouth shut. And that's what happened. 
And righteousness kept its mouth shut, and evil was succeeding here. And the vision of the evening and mornings which had been told is true. In other words, Daniel got this vision of the rise of the, this madman and his family. So, it's very interesting that this subject takes so much space in God's holy word. I know it's history. But while your millennial maniacs, if you don't mind me calling them that, all they talk about is the future, the future. None of this ever happened yet, they say. And then here's God's Word. It is taking up with so much information on history. And the futurists say that it hasn't even happened yet. Now, the futurists believe that the future is the key to the present. So we'll never be able to understand any of this stuff. In our lifetime, we'll never figure it out. That's sad. No one's ever been able to figure it out for 2,000 years. And so far as I know, no one ever will figure it out unless they're living when Christ comes, perhaps, they, so they say. <laughs> but on the other hand, the Bible says the prophecy has its fulfillment in the past. It also has its fulfillment as we read it in the present. So the past is the key to the present. The future is not the key to the present. The past is. And so we're going to look at this information from history, and we're going to really make some very interesting conclusions based upon it. Now, Daniel in the uh, 11th chapter picks up on it again, and he goes into tremendous detail. Daniel is a historical prophet. Ezekiel, who was contemporary with Daniel, is more of an apocalyptic prophet. Both of them talk about the same events, but one is more apocalyptic than the other is. Uh, both of them were deported to Babylon. Daniel was taken there as a slave, as a captive, about 606 B.C. Uh, I'm going to say that Ezekiel was deported there about 591 B.C. And uh, they're about anywhere from 10 to 15 years apart in their lives. We know that in the Bible, Ezekiel comes before Daniel. And probably in history, Ezekiel came before Daniel. But uh, they would have known each other. They would have read each other's writings. They, they were contemporaries. They're living in the same country. They're under the same conditions. They are in captivity because of their covenant faith in God. So, that being the case, Daniel got a prophecy of the 400-year period that would take place when no prophets would be on the scene and the only thing you had was the reading of the Bible. Now we're going to get real quiet and silent right here at this point. Someone shut the door back there so we will have no intrusions at all into this subject because we're going to talk about Gog of Magog. Now, I'm being a little bit mystical about that, you know. Some people think that there are prophets today and, uh, you know, you got to, uh, consult a prophet to get wisdom instead of consulting your Bible. <laughs> Reminds me a little bit of one time. You know, I get picked on all, all the time because of my deafness, but sometimes I laugh at myself too. And, uh, and then sometimes I, I use my definite, deafness to get even with people. I went into a sheets one time, and uh, uh, my hearing aid was ringing. I had it in my, I had it here in my vest pocket. My hearing aid was ringing. And it makes this real high-pitched voice when it rings. It sounds real high, and it's undetectable to my ear. I can't even hear the, the frequencies, but everybody in the world can hear it. And so when I see people going like this looking around, I know my hearing aid is ringing in my pocket. So I went into sheets, and that thing was squealing to beat 60. And everybody's in there, and the clerk's in there, and, and I'm getting my coffee and everything, and I knew that they were hearing that squealing from the frequencies of my hearing aid. And so... Uh, they said, what is it? What is it? 
She looked up. She looked down. She looked to the left. She looked to the right. What is that strange noise in here? And I said, I think I know what it is. So they all said, well, what is it? I said, I think it's coming from over here. So I put my left hand in my pocket where my hearing aid was at, and then I took my hand and I slapped the counter like that, and subsequently I turned off my hearing aid and it stopped. You could have heard a pen drop in that Sheets restaurant. <laughs> How did you do that? I said, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> so on the way out, I got my coffee, and everybody's looking at me, you know, and this guy came up to me, and he says, can you find water with one of those branches, too? I said, don't test me, buddy. Don't test me. But I got to thinking how people are looking for a clairvoyant, soothsaying prophet. You know that? Everybody wants to have some person in this world that has a little bit of a touch with the supernatural, the occult or something, and how easy it is to deceive people, as I did in that. I just did that to see how easy it is to deceive people. They really thought I had some magical charm to stop an eerie noise that was ringing through that place, you know. And I didn't say anything to the contrary. I, I was afraid that it would be too embarrassing if I told them what, what it really was. Now, when you talk about Gog and Magog, in the battle of Armageddon, I'll tell you what, you're going to loan yourself to the lunatic fringe or you're going to read the Bible and know what you're talking about. Tonight we're going to read the Bible and we're going to learn what we're talking about. First of all, Daniel would have known. I'm going to give you real quickly, and this, by the way, is in the synopsis that I've given to you, the syllabus uh, from my book on end times. Uh, you have possession of that. And I'm going to go through this with you. Some of you have already read it. You need to read it. You need to study it. It's the most interesting stuff in the Bible. Uh, there are at least seven chapters that God has given over to this, and we need to learn it. The little horn that came out of that shaggy goat came out of the Seleucian dynasty. So Daniel would have known that Antiochus was, was prophesied in the Bible. All right. Read Daniel 11.20 for us, Brother Williams. Daniel 11:20. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute through the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. Okay, so uh, this guy here uh, uh, in verse uh, 2, that one of the Seleucians, descendants of, uh, of Alexander's general, was a tax raiser. And that for 12 years he reigned and he was a tax raiser. That was what he was famous for. He was a tremendous Democrat. And uh, he raised taxes throughout the whole empire. And, and in verse 20, uh, 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 he was an oppressor. Uh, and uh, he was finally uh, murdered. He was poisoned by uh, Heliodorus, one of his rivals. Daniel would have known that when he wrote, in the 6th century before Christ. He would have known what happened in the year 146 before Christ. 500 years later, he's writing something that if you were reading the book of Daniel, you could see what was going to happen. Daniel would have known that a vile man was going to succeed him. That is the tax raiser. So if we read uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 21, uh, we're going to read that now. In his place shall arise a contemptible person, to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall not, come... Okay. I'm sorry. He shall Did come in it? without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Okay. Daniel would have known that a vile man would succeed him uh, and uh, that this, this, uh, this horrible uh, tax-raising uh, 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 king would be succeeded by one of the... He was so vile that he was unworthy of the honor of a man, much less that of a king, in verse 21 of Daniel. Now, this is Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, he would have known that this man was a flatterer. He, he, he was able to wake, work his way into office through political flattery. And uh, he knew that uh, he would invade Egypt 
So here comes Antiochus in his campaign coming down the coastline on his way to Egypt, and you're reading Daniel 11 and, uh, and everything that he's doing, you're reading in prophecy before it happens. Now Antiochus had a sister by the name of Cleopatra, and she was one of the first of the long line of uh, Egyptian queens by the name of Cleopatra. And uh, all this, anyone who knows anything about history knows uh, that Daniel was hitting the nail right on the head. And in verse 22, read that for us, Brother Williams. Army shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, and the prince of the covenant also. Now, in order for anyone to move from the north down to the south, we're talking about, uh, if you have a map here, you know that Greece and Syria are in the north. Uh, you have to come down the coastline, and, and Jerusalem's not far. And uh, the holy people, the covenant people, are right in the pathway of any army that's going to Egypt. One of the things that Antiochus hated, he hated the people of the covenant and the prince of the covenant. The prince of the covenant was Jesus Christ. The seed of David would eventuate in Jesus Christ. And he wanted to destroy covenant people, thus destroying the line that would come through those covenant people. So his war was actually against God. <laughs> his war was against the king of kings and lord of lords, the prince of the covenant, the angel of the covenant in the Old Testament is always the Lord Jesus Christ, always. So in trying to destroy the covenant people, he would have destroyed the line that was going to produce Christ. So this is pretty serious stuff. It's not just history. This is a war between Satan and God, the seed of Satan and the seed of the covenant. Antiochus is the seed of the serpent, and the covenant people are the seed of the woman. A war going on here. Tremendous war going on here. Okay, now... Down in Egypt, and the minute he begins to move toward Egypt, he's got the covenant people in mind. There's two things he wants to destroy. He wants to conquer Egypt, and he wants to conquer Jerusalem. Uh, he wants to take all the treasure of Egypt, and he wants to take the covenant people away from Jerusalem. That's the two priorities in Antiochus' mind. We're going to read from uh, chapter 11 now and verse 26. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, 24 and 25 of Daniel 11. Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers have done. Scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods, he shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for plots shall be devised against him. Now, if you recall, the kingdom was divided into four segments, two of which lost out to the north and the south. The north was Seleucius, the king of the south was Ptolemies. So when we read about the north and the south, that's all that existed as far as Asia and uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean world. Rome was a rising star in the west. But the east is controlled by the northern and the southern Seleucians and the Ptolemies. Now, since the south had been able to sustain stability and solidarity, none of the northern kings had ever been able to conquer them, but now, for the first time, Antiochus Epiphanes IV does something that none of his fathers had previously been able to do. He conquered Egypt. Now, Ptolemy Philometer was a very weak king, and, and, and um, Antiochus knew that. Uh, an enemy always knows when you have a weak president. A little bit like uh, Jimmy Carter when he was in presidency of the United States. He was a very weak president, and our, our enemies knew that. Uh, they, they took hostages in Lebanon, and uh, so, you know, uh, uh, all that Jimmy Carter ever did was negotiate. He, he didn't go in there and issue an ultimatum. And then uh, when uh, uh, 
uh, when things, things got really bad, Russia invaded Afghanistan, uh, Jimmy Carter got mad. And he said, I'm going to boycott the Olympics. <laughs> and uh, so somebody said that, <laughs> that Jimmy Carter had a vision, and he was uh, looking uh, in a vision at Teddy, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who said, you've got to walk softly and swing a big stick. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he said, how you doing, Carter? Carter said, I'm doing terrible. He said, the Russians are invading uh, Afghanistan. He said, well, uh, did you issue him an ultimatum to back off? Uh, he said, no. He said, what did you do? He said, uh, I boycotted the Olympics. He shook his head and said, man, that's the weakest thing you could have done. And so what's, what else happened down there? He said, well, the, the Muslims took uh, American soldiers hostage over there. Uh, he said, did you go in there and tell them to release them, or are you going to blow them off the face of the map? He said, no. What would you do? He said, well, I negotiated. He said, how long did you negotiate? He said, for a year. He said, Carter, the next thing you know, you're going to be giving away the Panama Canal. I mean, weakness invites war. Strength invites peace. That is an axiom. If people know you're strong, they're going to leave you alone. Now, we don't advocate war, but we advocate strength. Strength stops war. Well, you had a weak king in Egypt. Now, this guy's name was the Gross. Ptolemy Palama, the Gross. Can you, can you imagine going uh, to war against a guy whose name was the Gross? He changed his name to Aragetes. Uh, I changed my name to Aragetes too. They called me gross. <laughs> but uh, uh, he was so weak that the scriptures, Daniel says, that he was easily persuaded. And he had anarchy. He had strife in his army. And uh, he, he just couldn't control anybody. And Antiochus took advantage of that. And Daniel knew. Look at verse 27. Look at verse 27. And as for the two kings, their minds shall be bent on mischief. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail. For the end is yet to be at the time appointed. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Philom uh, uh, Ptolemy Philometer was a weak king, but it was Ptolemy, his successor, uh, Physcon, who was called the Gross. But they were both very weak. And his army and his navy was wiped out. As it says there in 1126, that Antiochus scored a great victory over Egypt. But he continued to prop up uh, Ptolemy Philometer, prop him up as a puppet king, but there's not enough room in Egypt for two kings. It's either going to be Antiochus or it's going to be one of the, the, the Ptolemies. So read verse 27 again, chapter 11, verse 27, please. And as for the two kings, their minds shall be bent on mischief. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail. For the end is yet to be at the time appointed. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how did Daniel know all these details? <laughs> Here are two kings sitting at the table talking to each other. They're lying to each other, and they both know they're lying to each other. <laughs> and it's nothing but pure politics, pure politics, buddy. It's like uh, Brother Williams told me before class tonight that uh, a politician will vote for a bill just to say he voted for a bill. He doesn't read the bill. He doesn't know what the bill says. He just says, I vote, you know, A. <laughs> All favor, A. A. If the tide and the wind's blowing in your favor, A, you know. And that's exactly the kind of politics we're seeing here. Daniel prophesied it right down to the T. Now, Daniel knew that the holy city would be plundered because uh, Antiochus' heart now is swelled up with pride. He's conquered Egypt. Uh, he owns most of the eastern world, all but Rome. But he heard that the Jews were spreading a rumor about him that he had died, and he got mad at the Jews. First Maccabees 1, uh, 19 tells us he got mad at the Jews. And uh, he decided that he's going to go wipe these people out. They are singularists and... Uh, uh, Antiochus is a pluralist. In a world of pluralism where everything goes, no matter what you believe, it doesn't make any difference. It's hard to be a covenant person. And so he's able to get the whole world eating out of his hands. 
All gods are accepted. All images are accepted. All faith is accepted. All philosophy is accepted, except for one faith, and that is the worship of the true God. We don't want to accept that. It's like you go to school, and they say, we're going to teach all religions in this school except one, and that's Christianity. <laughs> we believe in religious freedom, except for Christianity. We believe in religious toleration, except for Christianity. <laughs> Why? Because Christianity rubs us the wrong way because it, 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 it's actually too holy for us worldly people. You know, we got to practice on how to be worldly and be good religious people. You know, let's be as worldly as we can be and still be good religious people. And these covenant people really rub, rub us the wrong way. Now, in chapter 11, 28, Chuck, uh, Diodorus Siculum and Josephus write about the mighty exploits of how that Antiochus now went back up north, went to Jerusalem, and he slew 80,000 people, women and children. He took 40,000 prisoners. He sold 40,000 into slavery. And if that were not enough, he went to the high priest, Menelaus, and he said, are you a covenant man? And he said, no. He said, whatever you want me to believe, I'll believe it. Whatever, whichever the wind blows, he said, that's where I'm going. Wherever you push me, that's the way I'm going to move. And so Antiochus said, look, I'll support you and uh, I'll broadcast you as being the high priest of all of these uh, slimy covenant people uh, if you'll just let me go into the holy place because I have been forbidden to go into the holiest of the holy places in the temple. Let me go in there and see what it looks like. And Menelaus, the high priest, escorted Antiochus right into the holiest of holy places. And he looked and saw the golden candelabra. He looked and saw the Ark of the Covenant. He looked and saw uh, all of the gold and silver and all of the beautiful uh, 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 holy furniture. And he took it all out and enriched himself so he could go to war uh, even further and finance his army a little further. Uh, and uh, not only that, but he took a pig and sacrificed it right on the holy altar of God took the most unclean animal, the animal that causes swine flu. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, he boiled it, and he spread the broth all over the interior of God's holy temple. This was a mockery of the holy Yahweh and the mockery of the atoning blood of the covenant. Nothing could have been more profane than that. Chapter 11, verse 28. Now, Uh, if you go back to Daniel, uh, Daniel was wondering about this, and uh, he, he, he said, how long is this going to last? How, how, I mean, how long is this guy going to succeed? Okay. And uh, in verse 13 of Daniel 8, I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? while the transgressions uh, cause horror so as to allow both the holy place and the, and the host to be trampled. I mean, here comes a, 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 an unholy Gentile trampling into the holy place, offering pigs uh, broth and, and uh, erecting shrines to Jupiter, uh, his God, and calling himself Jupiter, by the way. Here, there's nothing could be more profane than that. How long is it going to last? Well, Daniel's listening to one angel say, how long is it going to last? And, of course, the angels already know what the answer is. It's like these questions that I'm asking you in the book of Revelation. Uh, I wrote the questions down so I know the answer. But I'm still asking the question, <laughs> even though I know the answer, to see if you know the answer. Are you with me? <laughs> so uh, uh, the angel asked the question. He knows the answer. The other one says, uh, how long is it going to be? And they know Daniel's listening. And Daniel's greatly interested because he wants to know how long is this thing going to last? Is it going to go on forever? Are they going to profane God's holy covenant forever and ever? And he said, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, verse 14. Now, 2,000 evenings and mornings are actually 2,324 hour days because the temple's going to be profaned and the people of God are going to be profaned. And uh, the temple had to be set up in such a way as they would light the candle in the evening and then they would light the candle in the morning. So 
uh, he's going to profane the temple, which means that he's going to not just profane the temple, but he's going to profane the whole holy city of Jerusalem. And it's going to last for exactly 2,300 evenings, about six years and 140 days to be exact. So Daniel heard the answer. So when Daniel writes this in the year 600 B.C., he's writing about something that's going to happen in 146 B.C., and it's going to last for six years and 140 days. So if you're reading your Bible and you know when it starts, you know exactly when it's going to come to a close, don't you? Because you've read the Bible. Now, brothers and sisters, we go back now to what Daniel would have known was going to happen in the year 146. Chapter 11, verse 29, Brother Williams. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before. Okay. Now, after he finished taking all the treasures from the Jews, he decides that he's going to go back to Egypt and beat them up again. He's already beat them up once. But in the meantime, the Egyptians are trying to strengthen themselves. And here's what they do. Ptolemy Philometer came to an agreement with his brother, uh, Ptolemy Piscon, who changed his name from Gross to Aragatis, to unite their power against this madman. Antiochus invaded in B.C. 167. But as Brother Williams read from verse 29, it wasn't going to be like it was the first time. This time, the Egyptians had strengthened their forced fortresses by hiring Greek mercenaries, like the, the Hussians from Germany were hired uh, by uh, the, uh, the British people to fight in revolution. And uh, they summoned the Roman Senate, and Rome sent three ambassadors to Egypt. One of them, his name was... Caius Papilius Linnaeus. Now here's what happened. They parked themselves off the coast of Egypt and uh, they brought their fleet to Cyprus, which is called uh, the coast of Shittim. The old word is Shittim. The, the new word is Cyprus. And they navigated their fleet down toward Egypt, and they began to monitor Antiochus' troops as they were coming down the coastline. When, I, when Antiochus arrived at uh, uh, Lucene, about four miles from Alexandria, Egypt, he met Caius Popelius Lenius, Caius Decimus, and Caius Hostilius, ambassadors from the Roman Senate. They were taken by ship, by a small boat, to shore, and they intercepted Antiochus. And while that his armies began to camp down, they had a conference. And they said, you've gone too far. This is as far as you go. You will not invade Egypt again. Antiochus scratched his head and said, Give me a little time to think on that. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you didn't fool around with those old Romans. They weren't Jimmy Carter's. Uh -uh. Uh, they weren't uh, Madame Albright's. <laughs> uh, they weren't uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's when it came to war. They were not peaceniks. They believed that strength was the only answer to war. And here's what they did. They didn't go to war with him. Papilius took out his sword and he made a circle around Antiochus in the sand. And there stood the proud Antiochus. And he said, you will make your decision before you leave this circle where we're going to get all of you. We're going to go to war with you. Rome will declare an official act of war against Syria. And what did Antiochus do? 
He said, okay. And he summoned his army and said, we have to leave Egypt. And who did he take his wrath out upon? Let's just say there in verse 30 and 31, Brother uh, Williams, who did he take his wrath out on? For the ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and give heed to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the continual burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. <laughs> you would think <laughs> that he'd be mad at Rome, wouldn't you? <laughs> you would think that he's going to go to war with this mighty Rome. But he was a hostage in Rome when he was a young boy. He knew how powerful Rome was, and so he goes back and picks on God's people one more time, doesn't he? Only this time it's worse. He was so angry at being rebuffed by Rome. He gave no pretext at all for his action. But in the year 167 B.C., he sent his commander Apollonius and an army of 22,000 soldiers to destroy Jerusalem again. This act of history cannot be explained any other way than a fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 11, 30, and 31. In fact, if you were to study those 400 years between Malachi and John the Baptist, if you were to go to a university and, 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 and have a course in this kind of history, you would find that Daniel is the most complete, the most concise outline of all that transpired of any book ever written on the subject. You get more information in such a little compass from Daniel than you do reading the whole textbook. Isn't it a shame that your millennial mad people say this never happened yet? Isn't that a shame? Because the only way that these people could have understood what was going on, they had to read their Bible. They read their Bibles. With a Bible in one hand and a sword in the other hand. They're saying all this is happening exactly as Daniel said it would. You see what God is getting the world ready for? Is he getting them ready for a Bible reading? Because the prophets are going to cease. Whether there be prophecy is going to cease. You don't need a guy who is a clairvoyant, soothsaying guy, talking about the future. All you need to do is read history. History is the key to the present. Now, Daniel would have known in the 12th place that a remnant of a few valiant men, such as Judas Maccabees, would fight back. In verse 33, read that. And those among the people who are wise shall make many understand.